Today, you have heard a variety of reasons, discussions, and arguments on how evolution does not fit in with God's creation. We have heard from faith and science, from authority and reason, from tradition and experience, as well as the effects of evolution on the church, on man, and on the world. During this last talk, we will look at one of the higher level arguments from our faith. We're going to use our faith. We're going to go vertical as to why evolution is not possible. We will look to Christ as the exemplar cause. That is, he's the blueprint of creation and see if any evolution is possible. Keep in mind that such arguments of this kind, that is, arguments of faith, are often more simple and yet more authoritative and more universal in their application than other arguments we can make or we may have heard. So on the one hand, let's set up a dilemma. On the one hand, because we are in a dilemma today, on the one hand, we have the position of Teilhard de Chardin, and I've chosen him because he's the one who's made evolution so popular inside the church. He says, you've heard it today earlier, is evolution a theory, a system, or a hypothesis? It is much more. It is a general condition to which all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must bow and which they must satisfy henceforth that they are to be thinkable and true. Notice the universals he's using. All, all, all. Everything needs to bow to evolution. Although many others could be quoted, many other uh, doctors, I mean, any, many other theologians, popes and other things could be quoted. It is well established that Chardin is one of the main sources of the spread of evolution within the church. Keep in mind that he is very much read and supported by many modern day prelates. Both Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI have mentioned him in various works in a positive light. He is a priest. He was a religious. He's famous. In the discussion of Gaudium et Spes at Schema 13 at Vatican II, it was revealed how strong Teilhard de Chardin's influence was on the council. The name of the French paleontologist quickly resounded in the hall. On October 22nd, one bishop saluted, quote, the illustrious son of the church, Teilhard de Chardin and compared his eschatology to that of St. Paul. On October 26th, another bishop, a council father, Bishop Spulbeck, he stressed the great influence of Teilhard de Chardin on the modern scientific world because, quote, he spoke our scientific language. We believe also that he understood our problems. And therefore, we turn to him to obtain help in the religions, in the religious questions that arise from our studies. The German bishop then ended by asserting that, quote, the difficulties and anxieties of many theologians, unfortunately, still stand in the way of the church's desired progress in this field. Something that goes back in time to Galileo for 400 years ago, and for which we are not completely without fault, end quote. Listen to this. The Freemasonic Grandmaster Masaudin. This is back in Italy. This is during the time of the Second Vatican Council. Identified Teilhard de Chardin's evolution of the cosmos as the meeting point between Freemasonry and Christianity, saying... Quote, this was brought up during the Second Vatican Council, by the way. Knowledge, philosophy, and metaphysics draw near to one another between the Masonic formula of the great architect of the universe and the omega point of Teilhard de Chardin. It is hard to discern what would keep thinking men from coming to an agreement. 
Currently, Teilhard de Chardin is certainly the author who is read most, both in the Freemasonic lodges and in the seminaries. We're reading the same books and we both like them. Why are we fighting? That's what he's saying. I can't uh, prove this. I found this quote. Um, I've not been able to verify it, but apparently Teilhard de Chardin is the only Roman Catholic author whose works were at one time on public display with those of Marx and Lenin in Moscow's Hall of Atheism. And our modern-day prelates, Christoph Cardinal Schonburn, says his fascinating vision has remained controversial, and yet for many it has represented a great hope. The hope that faith in Christ and a scientific approach to the world can be brought together. Cardinal Schonborn. So as you have heard earlier today, we also know that in 1996, Pope John Paul II, addressing the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, claimed, quote, Today, new knowledge has, been, has led to the recognition of the theory of evolution as more than an hypothesis. More than an hypothesis. It is indeed remarkable that this theory has been progressively accepted by researchers following a series of discoveries in various fields of knowledge, end quote. Pope John Paul II, okay. So on the one hand, we have all this that's in favor of Teilhard de Chardin. On the other hand, we have Pope Pius XII. In an official document of the church, Humani Generis, Remember, Pope John Paul II, that was a simple allocution, a simple speech of a pope to a pontifical academy of sciences. And it's questionable whether he actually gave that talk. doesn't matter, in my opinion, because it's been approved. He never contradicted it. He never pulled it off the, the line. Nevertheless, it's there as a simple allocution. This is more of a high-level document. It's an encyclical. Pope Pius XII said, some imprudently and indiscreetly hold that evolution, which has not been fully proved even in the domain of natural sciences, explains the origin of all things. There's that universal again. And audaciously support a monistic and pantheistic opinion that the world is in continual evolution. So monistic, it all came from one big bang, single cell. Pantheistic, it's all coming to be one thing. It's going to be God eventually. We're going to evolve into the cosmic Christ. Well, who is correct? How can we best resolve this difficulty? What are we to do as faithful Catholics? One pope says this, another pope says that. What are we going to do? How do we solve this problem? We got to use our faith. To solve this problem, let us turn to the incarnate word of God, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, without whom we can do nothing. He always has the answer. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. From Him comes the highest and most certain of arguments to dissipate all confusion and error. When one has the Christ, one has everything. Let's go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It says, in number 280, the mystery of Christ casts conclusive light on the mystery of creation and reveals the end, the purpose, for which in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. From the beginning God envisaged, envisaged the glory of the new creation in Christ. End quote. What does that mean? Mystery of Christ casts conclusive light on the mystery of creation. Some people can interpret that, I suppose, in a more of a Teilhardian view, but we need to look at our tradition. In order to understand this properly, we always got to look back and see what has always been said on this kind of thinking. So first, let's stir up our faith. And see that Christ is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega of all creation. St. John records our Lord saying in the Apocalypse, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. 
That basically means he's everything in between. He is where we, he's the one to whom we look. St. Paul describes the Christ as the firstborn of every creature. For in him were all things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. He is before all, and by him all things consist, that in all things he may hold the primacy, the first place. St. John says of the Christ, Thus says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, who is the beginning of the creation of God. The beginning of the creation of God. Listen to the fathers, the doctors, and the saints. St. Francis de Sales. God first willed and preferred by excellence the most amiable object of his love, which is our Savior, and then other creatures in order, according as they more or less belong to the service, honor, and glory of him. St. Lawrence of Brindisi refers to our Lord as the bedrock, the cornerstone, the foundation of all creation, such that Christ was willed as a foundation in such a way that if the edifice to be built upon him should ever need repairs, we know it does, if it ever needs repairs, that reparation could be carried out on the same foundation without any change in the divine blueprint. This is why God didn't start over when Adam and Eve sinned, because he already had laid the foundation in Christ. This is an echo of St. Paul saying, For other foundation no man can lay, but that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. St. Thomas Aquinas says, What is first in any order is the cause of everything which follows it. So if Christ is first, he's going to somehow be the cause of everything that comes after. Even if that's only he's the blueprint. Eugenio Pacelli, later Pope Pius XII, shortly before he became Pope, said, Jesus Christ is God's masterpiece, the greatest of his works. And whatever moment and circumstances of his manifestation in time, he is the first to be willed by God in view of him were all things brought into being. In view of the Christ, all things were brought into being. Very powerful statement. In a word, Christ Jesus is the Alpha of creation. Christ is also the Omega of creation. In other words, he's also the purpose, the final cause for which all things were made. Once again, St. John reports our Lord saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. St. Maximus the Confessor, he died in the year 662. He adds, it's a powerful statement. Christ is the blessed end for which all things have been created. Notice how he speaks. He's the blessed end for which all things have been created. Not all things are going to be Christ or going to evolve into an omega point, which is Christ. No, we are made for him. We're not going to be made into one Christ. Christ is the blessed end for which all things have been created. The end for which God has willed all things and which it, which is itself subordinated to nothing else. It is for Christ that all the ages exist and all things contained within them have found in Christ the beginning and the end of their call to existence. St. Francis de Sales. Sacred providence determined to produce all the rest of things, both natural and supernatural, for the sake of the Savior. Thus, all things have been made for this divine man. Once again, the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches the mystery of Christ casts conclusive light on the mystery of creation and reveals the end. 
for which in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We have the sacred liturgy on Easter vigil, establishes Christ's primacy and of place in all creation. Or as the priest is blessing the Paschal candle, he says, Christ yesterday and today, beginning and end, Alpha and Omega, all time, all times are his and all ages. To him be glory and dominion through all ages of eternity. Amen. Both scripture and tradition speak clearly that Christ is everything. That he is in all in all. He is all in all. In a word, Christ recapitulates in himself all creation as explained by St. Irenaeus. He died in the year 202. This is very early in the church. He says, Christ recapitulated everything in himself in order that just as the word of God has the primacy over the super celestial, spiritual, and invisible, he might also have it over the visible, corporeal beings, assuming this primacy in himself. He summates summarizes everything in all levels, even the supernatural, even what is beyond creation, what is of God. No wonder then St. Paul exclaims, God hath highly exalted him and hath given him a name which is above all names, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those that are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, And that every tongue should confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the glory of God the Father. Philippians chapter 2. From the ancient thinkers to our own day, man has been seen as a microcosmos of the macrocosmos. He's a summation of all creation in himself. This makes the God-man Christ the microcosmos of the entire universe. He's a cosmos in miniature. The angelic beings find themselves summarized, represented in his intellect and his will. His rational part of his soul. The animals in his sensate or sensible soul. The vegetables, the plants in his nutritive soul. The minerals in his bones and elements of his body. And humans, humans find themselves modeled after him as their prototype. He's our prototype. In this way, he is the summation and the recapitulation of all creation. Christ Jesus is the center of all things. Listen to Cardinal de Beruel. He died in 1629. He's a famous cardinal, started the French oratory. He taught this divine mystery, that is the incarnation, is like the center of the created and uncreated world. It is the only place where God chose once and for all to contain and reduce to our level both the world and himself. That is his own infiniteness and the immensity of the whole universe. It all meets together in the Christ. St. John of the Cross put this poetically. He captured it poetically as he's so able to do. Only contemplatives can do these things. With God the Father speaking, he says, My son, only your company contents me. And when something pleases me, I love that thing in you. Whoever resembles you most satisfies me most. And whoever is like you in nothing will find nothing in me. I am pleased with you alone, O life of my life. Very powerful words. My son, only your company contents me. 
When something pleases me, I love that thing in you. Now, all this shows how Christ is the exemplar cause, the blueprint of all creation. St. Thomas Aquinas held the following principle. That which is most perfect is always the exemplar of that which is less perfect. That which is most perfect is always the exemplar of that which is less perfect. We have saints who are exemplars of virtue for us. And so we, less perfect, try to imitate them, more perfect, to become virtuous. Christ, the image of the invisible God, the perfect microcosmos, the center of all things, is the exemplar cause of all creation, as well as recreation, meaning redemption. So in the prologue of St. John's Gospel, we hear, without him was made nothing that was made. He was in the world and the world was made by him. At least in the sense that he was the blueprint, the exemplar cause. And there's other ways too that he was, the world was made by him. But this is how some of the fathers have interpreted. He is the blueprint. The world was made by him. St. Paul declares, In Him were all things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. And in Him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All, all, all the treasures. Notice the universals the saints keep using in regards to Jesus. They keep referring to Him as encompassing all things. Christ, therefore, is the universal prototype, foundation, blueprint of all creation. He is creation's exemplar cause. We've carefully looked at the fathers, at least in some degree. We could find more. We've looked at the scriptures. You could probably find a lot more there too. We see We looked at some of the fathers, some of the teachings of the church as far as the catechism, Pope Pius and others. We see that he is the exemplar cause. We're not just pulling this out of thin air in the 21st century or even the 20th century. This has a history, a long tradition. Now, this is represented in various icons of the church. Icons writing about creation, displaying Christ present at the day of creation. So, see here, we see our Lord, that's Jesus. Look, he's the one who's putting the sun and the moon in the sky. Even though he hasn't been made in his body yet, he's in the mind of God. He's the blueprint. And so this icon represents that. And if you don't believe this, go to Jude. It's only one chapter. And in that chapter, it says, Jesus is the one who led Moses and the people across the Red Sea. But he hasn't born yet. Isn't that interesting? That's Scripture, folks. Jesus, it says, by name. Then we have another cathedral here, another big church. This is European. These are old. These are at least middle-aged churches or Renaissance. So you see Jesus up there. Look, you got all the animals in the ocean here. You got man there and all the animals on sea. He's the one who is the blueprint of these things. And then we've got another icon here. It's kind of, uh, we see him making all the animals. Notice once again. They always put these, a lot of these put Jesus in the picture, not God the Father. Jesus. He's the blueprint. He's the exemplar. Yet another one. So you can see these are in multiple places around the church. People had faith, they knew where things came from. St. Bonaventure taught that no man can claim to understand the universe unless he can explain how things come from God, how God shines forth in them, and how they return to God. St. Thomas 
and using a different, a different way of thinking. Exitus, how things come out from God. Reditus, how things go back to God. Exodus, Reditus. Man has, in order to understand the universe, he must understand the Exodus, how things come from God, what happens to them in the world, and then Reditus, how they can return to God. So how things come from God? Well, that's Christ as the Alpha. How things return to God? That's Christ as the Omega. And how He shines forth in things? That's Christ as the Exemplar. We've done it. We understand something of the whole universe when we understand the Christ. Now we're ready to address the dilemma that we proposed at the start of this conference. There's no higher name, no higher word, no higher reason for all created things to which we can look than Christ Jesus. If therefore... Evolution is truly much more than a theory or a hypothesis if, using Chardin, it is a general condition to which all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must bow and which they must satisfy henceforth if they are to be thinkable and true, as Chardin contends, then evolution must be found in Christ. If evolution is true, we must be able to find it in the Christ. Do you get it? If evolution, on the other hand, or if, on the other hand, evolution cannot be found in the Christ, then evolution is not possible, is it? The ancient saying of the fathers comes to mind here. What is not taken up by Christ is not redeemed by Christ. What is not taken up by Christ is not redeemed by Christ. If evolution cannot be found in Christ, then it is not redeemable and should be discarded as a work of Antichrist. It's against the Christ. It's not of Christ. For his part, Chardin claims that evolution can be found in Christ. In a discussion with Father Gabriel Allegra, Chardin states, now I'm going to stop here for a moment, just to show you how bad things were. They were really working hard to get Chardin approved. Allegra was in China. He was a Franciscan. He was in Hong Kong. The Cardinal Archbishop during World War II sent Allegra to go talk to Chardin. He specifically told Allegra, do everything you can to get his books approved. Allegra had meeting after meeting after meeting with Chardin. And he wrote the bishop and said, his works, none of them can be approved. They're all heretical. Even though the guy was very congenial. So in their discussion, Chardin states, the vision of the universe I have arrived at is not completely clear. Well, imagine that. The vision of the universe I have arrived at is not completely clear in all to details. But as a whole, it fascinates me. I'm enthusiastic about it. And when I think that all things have as their beginning and center and end, Le grand Christ, the great Christ. I am literally dazzled. So what's he saying? I got a reason for the beginning. I got a reason for the end. I got a reason for all that's in between. Look, see? The great Christ. Sounds like what I've been trying to say already. He goes on to explain how he thinks the world is broken up into various epochs of millions and billions of years claiming that we are now, quote, in the era of the Homo sapiens, end quote. But nevertheless, man will continue to evolve or, quote, develop into an ascending process toward totalization, which is the crowning of much effort and pain, and the painful childbirth, as it were, of evolution. By the way, whenever he used the word evolution in writing, he would capitalize it, capital E, for all evolution. 
totalization in turn will lead to unanimization. Just as millions of years before now, the geological factors led to harmonization. In this ascent, man is both the axle and the spoke, and both and in both capacities he tends toward the omega point, Christ, the great Christ, the cosmic Christ. End quote. For Chardin, therefore, Christ is the great evolver. He called him the great evolver. The essential mover of a harmonization leading to an ultra-harmonization or man become greater than man. We're just in one period now. We're in this harmonization. But we're all finally going to come into totalization, unanimization. We're all going to become one. We're going to become God, in other words. Pantheism, basically. Monistic pantheistic, just as Pope Pius XII said. Jesus said, I have come not to destroy, but to fulfill the law. Chardin literally, and for pious years, blasphemy interpreted this as, I have come not to destroy, but to fulfill evolution. Capital E. Right from Chardin. Christ came not to fulfill the law, but evolution. He's the great evolver. Note that according to this way of thinking, Christ Himself cannot have a fixed human nature. Since man must continue to evolve beyond man to something new until all becomes one or even God in the great Christ. So Christ as the great evolver is more than just being an agent of evolution, but He Himself must also somehow evolve beyond his human nature so that he can be the omega point of, for all creation. He must be ultra-human, more than man, a new man, a new being. That's not yet. Chardin's conception of Christ is not that of the church. Don't you see? He's taken the notion of Christ and he's gutted it and he put a new meaning in it and he's presenting it to you as Christ. See, I, I, I'm a Christian. I believe in Christ. You're attacking me. You're calling me a heretic. I believe in Christ too. That's hard. That's Chardin. And it's not surprising to learn that Chardin had had trouble with the Incarnation. By the way, if you read his biographies, he was in the deserts in China during World War II, I believe. And he said, a spiritual force, spiritual being entered into him. Those are his words. I should have brought the exact quote with me today, but I forgot it. But anyway, it's pretty powerful stuff. What's really going on here, folks? This is the main purveyor in the church of evolution. The one who's made it so popular. So wait a minute. Wait a minute. Christ as the exemplar cause, as the summation and center of creation, He's the perfect man. And what is perfect? Perfect doesn't evolve. It's perfect. Using the writings of many fathers like St. Jerome, Hilary, Cyril, and Theodoret, some of the major fathers of the church, St. Lawrence of Brindisi explains that man is made in the image of Christ, who is both God and man. Now, here's what he teaches. Christ was first predetermined in the divine mind. As the psalm says, in the head of the book, it is written of me. God then created the first man, Adam, in the image and likeness of that form. Remember the picture we saw at the beginning. Accordingly, Scripture says that in the image of God, namely of the incarnation, Christ, who is God, He created Him. Therefore, God created man in the image of God, the Christ. Namely, in that form and figure which had been predetermined for the Christ, the Son of God, before the formation of all creatures. 
whom St. Paul calls the firstborn of every creature in whom were created all things. Thank you, St. Lawrence of Brindisi. According to this doctor, image refers to Christ even as man, saying Christ himself was the archetype of our human nature. In other words, Adam was made in the image of Christ, not just spiritually, not just rationally, but even physically. That's amazing. I only learned this some years ago, and it really sets you back. Wow. St. Peter Chrysologus, he died in the year 450. He taught the first Adam was made by the last Adam. The first Adam, that's Adam in the garden, was made by the last Adam. That's second Adam, that's Jesus. From whom he, he also received his soul to give him life. The second Adam stamped his image on the first Adam when he created him. The last Adam is indeed the first. As he himself says, I am the first and the last. Tertullian died 225. He said, the shape that the slime of the earth was given was intended with a view to Christ, the future man. Second Vatican Council in Gaudium et Spes, the one that is said to be of Teilhard de Chardin, but there was a battle going on. And even despite some of those Chardinian bishops, battle was won in some ways. Listen to this. Only in the mystery of the incarnate word, incarnate word of God, does the mystery of man take on light. For Adam, the first man, was a figure of him who was to come, and they quote Tertullian. Namely, Christ, the final Adam, by the revelation of the mystery of the Father and his love, fully reveals man to man himself and makes his supreme calling clear. It is not surprising, then, that in him all the aforementioned truths find their root and attain their crown. He who is the image of the invisible God is himself the perfect man. Again, this is why we have these icons that show these beautiful truths. Look at that. See, Adam is made by Jesus in his image. Some of the mystics say they actually looked very similar, almost identical in some ways. In Michelangelo's now famous scene of Adam's creation on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, God the Father reaches out to give Adam life with his right finger, while his left is pointing and resting on the Christ child with his blessed mother. Now, God is, as it were, saying, Adam, we're creating you in the image of the Christ, and we are creating you for the Christ. Okay, so... This is what's in the mind of God. It's not yet in the world. It's in the mind of God. As if you were making a foundation, you were going to make a house. You have the blueprint already in your mind and maybe even on paper. Well, there it is. Blessed Virgin Mary, Jesus. Notice the difference. Now, here's what he's building, but he's going to build it ultimately for this. So now notice that, notice the finger there. Isn't that finger very similar to what's going on right there? See? Adam, I'm making you in this image for this. With Lady Wisdom, the Blessed Mother, in between. That's another whole conference. Would love to give sometime. Okay. Now, being made in the image of the Christ, Adam was created in a state of perfection. Okay? Adam was created in view of the perfect Christ. Adam was created in a state of perfection. Listen to St. Thomas Aquinas on the perfection of the first man, Adam, and other creatures, not just Adam, other creatures made at the beginning. This is a mystic. He had visions too. In the natural order, perfection comes before imperfection. 
And since God created things not only for their own existence, but also that they might be the principle of other things. So creatures were produced in their perfect state to be the principle, the principles as regard others, not just the man Adam, but all the creatures that were created at the beginning. They're the principles. So God put in all the animals what it took to propagate their species unto the end of the world. Now a man can be the principle of another man, not only by generation of the body, but also by instruction and government. Hence, as the first man was produced in his perfect state as regards his body for the work of generation, so also was his soul established in a perfect state to instruct and govern others. Adam had to be perfect because he's at the head of the human race and had to train all of us. He failed and lost everything, but it still, it, that was what it was supposed to be. Perfect. Now, although more proofs could be found and added to these, we nevertheless have sufficient data from the deposit of the faith, which I presented to you today in some ways, to see an insurmountable obstacle to Christ having any part with evolution. As the perfect man, he is the exemplar cause of all men. What is perfect cannot evolve, does not evolve. They're two different things. Evolution and perfection don't go together. By the way, this is precisely why you've probably heard ad nauseum from pulpits, at least I have since I was a youth, of priests and others, shame on them, for trying to make Christ evolve, claiming He didn't know who He was until a later date. How many times have you heard that? Once I heard, Jesus didn't know who He was until the finding in the temple. Next week, I went to Mass. No kidding. Different priest. Jesus didn't know who He was until He was baptized. Came back another week. Jesus didn't know who he was until he was on the cross. Well, make up your mind, okay? That's what we heard all the time, and I'm sure you've heard it too. But what does St. Paul say? What does St. Paul say? Shame on those men for saying those things, because they're false. What does St. Paul say? Jesus Christ, yesterday and today, and the same forever. Be not led away with various and strange doctrines. He is the same yesterday. He is the same today. And He'll be the same tomorrow. And same forever. That's the Christ I know. He is perfect in every way. And if He's not, then He's not the Christ. There's no room for any evolution here. Now maybe you're thinking to yourself, He's some of the smarter people. Father, what about that one little phrase in Luke's gospel where it says, and Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and grace with God and men. Once again, we have to always look at what the fathers and the church teaches. Commenting on this passage, the fathers and the doctors teach us from the first instant of his conception, Jesus was full of wisdom and grace. He was perfect. This being due to that humanity on account of its hypostatic union with the Word. Listen to St. Gregory Nazianzen. Fourth century. He says, He progressed in wisdom before God and men, not that he received any increase, since he was from the beginning absolute in grace and wisdom, but in that these gradually became apparent. Hitherto, those that were unaware of it. He became more obviously the Christ to men. Okay. Hence, Bede says, St. Bede, Venerable Bede, Christ progressed not by the passage of time, receiving what he had not, but rather in manifesting the gift of grace that he had. Note, therefore, that in the soul of Christ, there were three kinds of knowledge. Okay, first, beatific. In other words, he saw God 
face to face, and all things in God. So he was rendered blessed in the intellectual part of his soul. Even on the cross, he had the beatific vision. Teaching dogma of the church, de fide. Second, knowledge that was infused by God. So at the very beginning, God infused knowledge into Adam. All knowledge that he needed to know for all creation. And then third, there's the experimental knowledge that's acquired by daily use. Now, Christ was endowed with the first two from the first instant of his conception. To such a perfect degree that he could not increase them. Teaching of the church, teaching of the fathers, teaching of the doctors. Now, the experiential knowledge of Christ, he just learned what he already knew in a different way. So he actually went out and experienced what he already knew. So it came to him in a different way. Experiential knowledge. So there's no evolution there either. At least you'll find no support for it in Christ's church. If there is no evolution in Christ and there cannot be evolution in creation, or it's recreation, it's redemption, making evolution what? One of the strange doctrines to which the apostle is referring. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange doctrines. If there is no room for evolution in the exemplar, then he cannot be Chardin's evolver. And what is more, there can be no evolution in man at all. For how can man have evolved from lower species during so-called the period of hominization when the first man, Adam, was made according to the image of Christ, the perfect man, the prototype of Adam. You get it? How can it be? It can. Creation is, as it were, a book. It's an analogy. We can think of it like this. It's, it's as it were, a book. Every creature is a sentence or a word in this book. The author, the publisher of this book is the triune God. It is the task of human and angelic intelligence to read God's thoughts from this book and cooperate with Him. The theme, the dominant idea that runs throughout each sentence, even each word, is the Word made flesh. The incarnate Word of God, Jesus Christ. Because this Word says everything. This is why the angel said to Blessed Mary at the Incarnation, no word will be impossible for God. If you don't throw away all your other Bibles for any other reason, throw them away for this one. Because only the Douay Reims translates it right from the Greek. This is the right translation. No word will be impossible for God. Because the Word is Christ. And if it's in Him, it's possible. So many modern scripture and translations take out the word, Word. They say nothing is impossible for God. That is a mistranslation. Throw away those Bibles, burn them, and get a Douay Reims. So no new word can be added. Evolution is not a word found in this book. You get it? It's a fable. It's a myth. Pseudoscience. It is strange doctrine of which St. Paul warned us of so long ago. Now, Chardin made the bold claim that evolution... Getting behind. Chardin made the bold claim that evolution is a general condition to which all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must bow in which they must satisfy henceforth that they are to be thinkable and true. This is patently false since no evolution is possible in a perfect man. Perfect Christ. On the contrary, His description of evolution, of evolution's supreme place, fits that of the Christ. The truth incarnate. It is to Him and His name that we must bow. It is through Him and with Him and in Him that all theories alone 
It is through Him, with Him, and in Him alone that all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must submit and satisfy if they are thinkable and true. Chardin's statement is what then? Hello? It's blasphemy. It attacks Christ. It's seeking to replace Christ. The true Christ. It's trying to dethrone Him. The true book of creation, the true book of creation, the Word of God, Christ Jesus, predicted Chardin's ideas in the lives of the Israelites making their way through the desert of Sinai. King David relates in Psalm 105, They made a calf in Horeb, and they adored the graven thing. They changed their glory into the likeness of a calf that eateth grass. In making and worshiping the golden calf, these Israelites radically departed from the theme of creation's book, the Word made flesh, by trying to write, as it were, we are made in the image of beasts because we came from the beasts. And we are therefore like the beasts. There is some equality between us. We know the outcome. They proceeded to act like beasts. They became beastly and they were destroyed. The Holy Office certainly concurs with this conclusion, at least implicitly, when it provided the following admonition in the early 1960s. Admonition. Several works of Father Pierre Deschardins, some of which were published posthumously, are being edited and receiving considerable support. Refraining from a judgment in which, in that which concerns the positive sciences, it is quite evident that in philosophical and theological matters, the mentioned works are filled with ambiguities and even serious errors that offend Catholic doctrine. For this reason, the most eminent and reverend fathers of the Supreme and Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office exhort all ordinaries, as well as the superiors of religious institutes, rectors and seminaries, and directors of universities to protect minds, particularly of the youth, against the dangers of the works of Father Teilhard de Chardin and his associates. Protect them against what? What did he capitalize? Evolution. We have failed in following the admonition given to us by Christ through his church. St. Paul explains that Christ is our goal and that because of sin, man has fallen away from the perfect man. Through sin, man is deformed. Through sin, man falls further and further away from Christ. To regain our proper place, we seek to conform to Christ Jesus by restoring what was lost. Chardin, however, replaces deformation caused by sin with the concept of evolution. Therefore, don't worry so much about sin claiming that creation started in a state of imperfection or deformation and is evolving toward Christ as the omega point of creation. That's really helpful when it comes to sin and murder and disasters and disease. Don't worry about it. That's all part of the process. Relax. Be happy. This does not coincide with the data of divine revelation. This does not fit in with Christ as the exemplar, as the exemplar cause of all creation and as the perfect man in light of whom Adam was made. This doctrine of Chardin, therefore, must be rejected as dangerous and harmful to the faith. It is. As I've learned to finally conclude, it took me years to figure this out, it is the philosophy of the devil. It is the religion of the Antichrist. Now, something needs to be said regarding the statements of the popes and the prelates that place evolution and the teaching of Chardin in so favorable a light. In order for these statements concerning doctrine, touching on matters of faith and morals, to be binding, they need to have the cross present in them. I've tried to present you today the cross, whether you knew it or not. The vertical element is Christ speaking through his hierarchy of which I am a member. 
The person speaking these truths is in the chain of authority spanning heaven and earth. I'm very at the bottom, true. But still, there's a vertical element that goes all the way down. So we start with God the Father. We go all the way down. Pope, bishops, priests, dads, moms. Okay, there's an authority, a line of authority. That's the vertical. Horizontal element, in order to make the cross, to make it complete, we have to have a horizontal element. Christ spoke of this particular subject we're talking about, let's say, while He was with us. That's what makes it true. Because it came from the truth incarnate. And it has been passed down to us. The doctrine has a sort of genealogy, a pedigree, a tradition, in other words. It's traced back in time to the apostles and to Christ. Through the doctors and the fathers and the scriptures and tradition. Okay? Vertical, person teaching, has authority. Horizontal, it has a pedigree, has a genealogy, has a tradition. Put them together, you get the cross. If either is missing, then it's not binding. Since the prelates speaking favorably of evolution and of Chardin have a place in the hierarchy of the church, their bishops, even popes, they are in the line of authority. They've got the vertical in place. They're in a place of authority established by God that goes from heaven to earth. The vertical, once again, is in place. But that position or place in the hierarchy alone, by itself, does not give every word or action or decision they make an immediate share in God's authority. In other words, for this to happen, these words or actions and decisions must have some place in the book of the incarnate word. There's only one word. Again, they must have some pedigree, some genealogy, a tradition that traces them back to the Christ and His apostles. I've worked hard today to show you that everything I've told you goes back to the Scriptures through tradition as well. By the way, Chardin, very weak, hardly anything. He's just making it up as he goes and making up all kinds of words. Totalization, unimization, harmonization. No root for any of it. In every authoritative statement of the church's magisterium, there's always a presentation of the tradition behind the teaching. For example, when defining the Immaculate Conception, Pope Pius IX spent no little time tracing the doctrine back to the Scriptures and tradition through the Fathers, the Doctors, and the Sacred Liturgy. He well established the horizontal before he moved forward with the vertical and came down and said, we, Peter and Paul, define Mary's Immaculate Conception. See? Vertical. Horizontal, vertical. Cross, binding. Pope John Paul did, did this Likewise, when he ruled on whether women could be ordained to be priests. This is what must be done in order for any statement to give witness with any authority to the book of the incarnate word. Pope John Paul II and others presented no pedigree, no genealogy, no tradition in their statements on evolution. Nothing was mentioned of the creed of Pope Pelagius I, a Fourth Lateran Council, Pope Zachary, the First Vatican Council, the Council of Cologne, Pope Leo XIII, Pope St. Pius X, Pope Pius XII, and on and on. They've not mentioned any of these things in their discussions on the origins of man and the created universe, as well as the viability of evolution. Thus... The saying of Melchior Cano, the great Dominican theologian at the 16th century council of, the, of Trent, comes to mind. He says, those who blindly and indiscriminately defend every decision of the supreme pontiff are the very ones who do most to undermine the authority of the Holy See. They destroy instead of strengthening its foundations. 
So every word that comes forth from the mouth of the Pope is not infallible. It can't contradict a whole line of teaching going back to the beginning. Since Pope John Paul II's statement on evolution has no genealogy, we are safe in considering it merely as the opinion of a Pope at the time of his speaking to a gathering of modern scientists. And we should not let that bother us. Again, St. Paul explains our task is not to evolve toward and into Christ, but rather to restore all things in Christ by first entering into His body, the church, that's incorporation, and then seeking total conformity to Him as the head of the church and exemplar of both our creation and recreation. Listen to his profound words. Christ Jesus is the foundation upon which we build anew. Here's what he says. Until we all meet into the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the age of the fullness of Christ. He's the perfect man. That henceforth we be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the wickedness of men. To and fro, carried about. Doesn't that sound like evolution to you? By cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive, but doing the truth in charity, we may in all things grow up in Him who is the head, even Christ. We have shown that evolution has no part or place in Christ, which means that it is not pleasing to God and that He will have nothing to do with it. We must conclude decisively evolution is not from Christ. It should be rejected as being of the Antichrist. So we may say, may that mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus, so that we can restore the primacy of place to Christ, the Alpha and Omega, the exemplar cause, the King of the cosmos. Again, I will quote St. John of the Cross. We'll end with this. He captures poetically in his ballads much of what we've concluded today. With God the Father speaking. This is a mystic who was intimately united with God. My son, your company contents me. And when something pleases me, I love that thing in you. Whoever resembles you most satisfies me most. And whoever is like you in nothing will find nothing in me. I am pleased with you alone. O life of my life. Viva Cristo Rey. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.